This is the Veterinary Project Podcast, Episode 18. Welcome to the show created by vets featuring absolutely no pets. This is the Veterinary Project Podcast, hosted by Dr. Michael Bug and Dr. Jonathan Light. Our resident veterinarians have swapped out their stethoscopes in favor of microphones to bring you the Veterinary Project Podcast, a show focused on real conversations aimed to connect this amazing profession full of remarkable people. Through the sharing of collective stories and wisdom and connecting over the many unique challenges we face, we invite you to join our community of veterinary professionals leading intentional lives. And now, here are the hosts of the Veterinary Project Podcast, Dr. Michael Bug and Dr. Jonathan Light. Hey everyone, welcome back. Mike and Jonathan here. Just finished up American Thanksgiving for everyone down in the States. And we're uh, heading in here first week of December, heading into the holiday season. I know Rosalie just put our Christmas tree up at like 4.30 this morning. She always does that. Um, so I thought I'd check in with Jonathan and see how things are going with him and his family. Well, we sure as heck aren't putting up Christmas trees at 4.30 in the morning. We're going to have to dive into this. Uh, no, things are good. We're getting prepped, you know, COVID style. We're definitely doing more online shopping this year. And I'm happy to say, I think I'm three quarters through. Hopefully Candace isn't listening to this. And uh, yeah, we're going to put up the tree this weekend and, you know, do it safe, do it COVID style. And we're, you know, just waiting to see whether we can get together with a little bit of family at Christmas time, but that's a month away. And hopefully things have calmed down a little bit by then. That's the goal for sure. Yeah, but, it's good. Well, let's, go ahead. Let's go back to this 430 again. So, and, and how come you're not involved in this? Well, I don't know. She does this where she just got so excited. Like I woke up at like 530 and I was like, how long have you been up? And she's like, 430. I got up and put the Christmas tree up. And I was like, what? That's so cool. Yeah. And she was so excited to see Riley's reaction. But I mean, it was still so early in the morning. She didn't really care. But yeah, I don't know. I guess our Christmas tree is up. That's hilarious. And do you normally partake in that or were you a little ripped off that you didn't get to put any uh, ornaments up? I was well, not fully decorated. Like the okay. tree is up and some of the base material is up, but there's still more to go. So that'll fake probably tree. be this weekend. Real tree or fake tree? Uh, this one's fake. Yep. We're not sure what we're going to do long term, but, and yeah, it's going to be so interesting to see like what the rules are we Saskatchewan just locked down even further we're supposed to limit to five people in a house so like you said Christmas is a month away so we'll see as we move out uh, what we can actually do for the holidays that's it for North America crossing fingers that numbers go down and that we have uh, that ability to still socialize and get together with some family which is so important mentally yeah absolutely Yep. Okay, we've got another great guest here we're going to dive into. Uh, before I dive into her bio, let's throw it back to you, Johnny, for today's quick tip. Okay, my quick tip today is actually not even a t it, it's a suggestion. It's a suggestion based on some of the podcasts when I'm not listening to the Veterinary po Project podcast. That's the Because <laughs> let's be honest, that's the only one you listen to. That is only every time. And we are lying by saying that. But there's two other podcasts I want to point out, which I think are completely cool podcasts. You guys that are listening might think I'm full of it. There's one that's called Chasing Excellence. And it is by a gentleman named Ben Bergeron. He is um, an elite athlete trainer. But they take this podcast in a completely different direction on how to be a better human, how to live better. And they have some amazing tools and tips and tricks that Candace and I use a lot in our day-to-day -day life. If we're traveling, we're going out to the mountains, we're listening to this podcast. So that's my first one. And then the second one is Bigger Pockets. For anybody that is looking to invest, Bigger Pockets has exploded in the last few years. They had their Bigger Pockets real estate podcast. Mike and I have listened to it for years. We've learned a lot off of it, but they also now have a Bigger Pockets money podcast and they've branded out. And again, this is another one Candace and I listen to when we're on the road, you know, both from an entertainment standpoint, but you take some really nice nuggets away. 
So my quick tip for today is go check those two podcasts out. In my view, they're amazing. We've gained a lot of knowledge from it and it's not the veterinary project podcast. That's it. Okay. I didn't know what your quick tip was going to be. So I have to add in a little bit, especially on the bigger pockets one. Uh, for anyone that's listening to our podcast and listens to Bigger Pockets, you may have noticed how similar the layout and the theme was. Um, and so I'm laughing because, to be honest, behind the scenes, when we were setting this up, um, I booked a call with Brandon Turner, who's who's the host of the Bigger Pockets podcast. So we chatted for like half an hour. So so thanks to Brandon, he gave me a ton. What's that? I see your hand up. How many followers and listeners do they have? Oh man, I I honestly don't know. I I thought I heard once that they have two hundred and fifty thousand downloads per episode. Yeah, you know, and I don't know what the stats are. Not everyone listens to every episode, so their audience would be, I'm assuming, a million plus. But I have no idea. I think you're right there. Yeah, they're in that top zero zero one percent for sure. Yeah. So we, we just we just jumped over fifty percent. So we're pretty proud of that, even as a start. For all you <laughs> listeners out there, we're loving it. It's amazing. Thank you yeah. for listening. <laughs> yeah, and we're having fun with it. But yeah, so booked a call with Brandon. He was he was so generous with all of the tips, and he basically said, like, look, we've got a formula that works. Follow ours closely, you know. And so huge shout out and thank you to Brandon because I know he's listening. He listens oh, to everyone. completely. Like he uh, loves the veterinary industry. Yeah. So anyway, I just had to add that in. Anyway, we digress. On to today's episode with our amazing guest, Dr. Sarah Bader. Sarah was born and raised in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. After completing an honors degree in biochemistry at the U of S, Sarah moved to Toronto to pursue a PhD in neuroscience. After five and a half years in Toronto, Sarah decided it was time to move home where she did a brief postdoctoral fellowship at the University of Saskatchewan before being accepted into the Western College of Veterinary Medicine and graduating in 2017. Sarah works part-time in small animal clinical practice as well as part-time at the WCVM teaching in the first year curriculum. Uh, Sarah sees companion animals and exotic pets in her clinical practice. However, her true love in veterinary medicine is surgery. Sarah is married to her husband, Daniel, who I am actually really good friends with uh, since high school. And together they have two stepchildren. Daniel and Sarah are expecting their first child together in February of 2021. Whenever Sarah is not working, she can be found spending time with her kids outside, baking, training for a triathlon, or at the lake. And in this episode, we dive in, uh, we spend a lot of time talking about sort of her path to becoming a veterinarian, how it's, you know, it's a little bit different than, than others. She sat on the admissions committee, so we talk about how that can actually be a benefit to the veterinary profession. We then jump over and spend a lot of time talking about sort of her job juggle, that time in clinical practice and teaching as a professor, sort of the pros and cons of both of them and how people can get into that type of hybrid model of career if they would like. And then lastly, we do a deep dive into one of the very important skills in veterinary medicine, which is euthanasia, talking all about all the soft skills needed to really be sharp with that skill. And in the impact round, I throw a little bit of a curveball at Sarah. You'll have to stay tuned to the end to uh, check that out. So without any further ado, I give you Dr. Sarah Bader. All right, Sarah, great to have you on. So in addition to your bio, which we just read for everyone, you are also the veterinarian that muscled me out here in Saskatoon. Daniel, your husband, a really good friend of mine from high school, I was his personal veterinarian until you came along and stole that from me. So That's true. Yeah, now he has his own in-house veterinarian. Um, so thank you so much uh, for joining us here today. You're welcome. I understand that he gets the same discount, though. I think you were pretty good to him over the years. Yeah, the, the bill got discounted to basically beer. However yeah. much beer he would bring over would dictate the level of service provided. That's perfect. Yeah. yeah. Okay, well, why don't we jump in here, Sarah? You have... 
Um, a really like interesting journey to becoming a veterinarian. I know, um, you know, we knew each other beforehand and I, I knew you were off in Toronto and you were doing like neuroscience stuff. Why don't you, for, for those listeners that maybe don't know you, fill us in kind of on your journey to becoming a veterinarian and, and what that path looked like. Yeah, it was sort of an interesting path and sort of intermittent in the vet world. Like every kid who's five wants to be a vet, right? Like every little girl is like, I'm going to treat puppies and kitties for my life and that's going to be a great job. And then you sort of like grow up and then, I mean, I was lucky to grow up in a family that was like full of overachievers. My dad has a PhD in engineering. My mom has a PhD in education. My brother went off to get a PhD in neuroscience. Both my sisters are lawyers. So I was like, oh man, I cannot be a slacker. So I better do something, right? Um, and so as you sort of like grow up and you realize that there are lots of possibilities, you almost get overwhelmed with possibilities. Again, we grew up in Saskatoon in sort of like a middle-class neighborhood where you could be anything. I never felt like I couldn't be an engineer just because I was a girl or whatever, right? And so you're just like, oh, then you're overwhelmed with possibilities. I always liked science. So did an undergrad degree, sort of your basic biochemistry degree there a dime a dozen. And then thought, well, I really want to, I would like to go to med school, right? I always thought I would be a surgeon. I always thought I'd be a plastic surgeon. I thought that would be a great job, right? Um, and so I'm going to go to med school, but my grades are not great because I hung out with you too much in undergrad. And, um, yeah. you, had, you were just smarter than everybody. I actually had to study. Isn't that the truth, Sarah? We can I go know. into that and totally knock Mike, but that's so true. Yeah. So, I mean, I was like a mediocre student, right? I was getting like 70s and stuff like that, but nobody's going to take you to med school when you got 70s. Everybody has 70s, right? So I was like, ah, I'm going to go to grad school. And because I worked in undergrad research labs for every, pretty much every summer, I really like research. I, I have lots of questions. I still have lots of questions and ideas and all that kind of stuff. And I like to have sort of a deeper understanding of how stuff works. So went off to grad school. I thought if, if you're ever going to leave Saskatoon, this would be the time to do it, right? Go have your sort of young 20s adventure and live in a big city and move away and do all that kind of stuff. And so I applied to med school many times. I wrote the MCAT like five times. And I just suck at standardized testing. It just, it doesn't work out for me, right? I thought if I could get an interview, that would be great. And I, I never could get a score good enough to get an interview. So I, then it started getting me sort of like reflecting on why I even wanted to be in medicine. Like, what was it about medicine that I loved? I thought, well, yeah, being like a surgeon would be super cool, but like being a pediatrician would be super cool. And I don't know, maybe being an ophthalmologist would be really cool. And maybe being a dentist would be cool. So, I mean, I thought, well, there's lots of different things now. I don't even know. And then I got thinking about other types of medicine. And I thought, well, what about veterinary medicine? Like on a daily basis, if you were a general practitioner, you could be maybe all of those things, right? You could be like an anesthesiologist and a dentist and a general surgeon and, a, and sort of a pediatrician and a radiologist all in the same afternoon. And like, how cool would that be? And I think I have like a, um, a controlled moderate level of like ADD where I like a good variety of things. I think if I was an ophthalmologist where I just did cataract laser surgeries all day, I think I would be bored. Those people are great at their jobs. They really love what they do, but I, I do like a little bit more variety. And so I applied to vet school and thought, well, we'll give this a go. And I got in on the first try, which everybody hates me because apparently that doesn't happen all that often. Um, and yeah, and then sort of the rest is history. I thought, um, now, now that you're in vet school, that there is a world of opportunities. You still can be a researcher, and you still could be a clinician, and you still could be a prof. And and I do do lots of those different things on a daily mm -hmm. basis. So yeah, I had a bit of a convoluted way to come here, but I'm happy sort of all the places that I went and and how it worked out. But I was saying to Mike, you know it's really great that the same cookie cutter person doesn't apply to vet school because the industry is so diverse that it really 
meets people from all different walks of life, people who are more mature students and people who come from mixed animal practice backgrounds and people who want to work in government and all that kind of stuff. So it's really great that um, even though I had a, a convoluted sort of pathway to veterinary medicine that I ended up finding something that was a really good fit. That's great. Yeah, I think, I think that is really important. You know, like I think back to my class, we had people that had full on other careers and then decided, you know what, I want to go and be a veterinarian and, and pivot and come over. And it's great to have all those like perspectives. I am curious, like, like, I mean, biochemistry, neuroscience, lots of overlap. Um, I'm assuming that has served you really well as a veterinarian. Yeah. I mean, I think you just have a few things that I think being a more mature student allowed for me to be successful. One is when I got to vet school, I knew how to study better. Like I was just, I had a better sort of plan and focus than some of the other students. Um, I had that sort of desire because I have like a research background of like trying to gain a deeper understanding of stuff and like really know how stuff works instead of sort of just memorizing stuff off the bat, which in clinical practice doesn't necessarily serve you well all the time. Um, and yeah, I think also just having a bit more life experience, right? Like I wasn't panicked. I would show up to an exam and be like, did I read all the material? No way. I did not. Am I worried about it? Not even a little bit. Right. So I think I just had sort of like this calmer approach to vet school, which I think lots of people find vet school super stressful, which, and no doubt about it, it was stressful. There's a lot of stuff going on. It's super busy. But I think I was just able to be that person who is not overwhelmed by the experience of going to vet school just because I'd, I had done life already. Like I had done lots of other stuff that was more stressful. And so I could just sort of take everything with a grain of salt. And I was like, if I don't get an 80, who cares? Right. We're, and it's sort of a shitty mentality if you think about it to be like, Oh, you only need a 60 to graduate. But the difference between an, an 80 and a 70 to me was not a big deal. And to lots of people, they like spent tons of time, really like beating themselves up about that. And I thought, well, move on. Just yeah. we're all going to the same place. Yeah. And, in, and as long as you're not going into an internship or a residency, seriously, since 2017, has anybody asked you what your grades were in vet school? Not a single person. Exactly. Yeah. There's way more important things once you're out there than what that grade was. And especially whether it was an 80 or 70, as long as you understand, obviously the material that's in front of you. Yeah. Yeah. And certainly, I mean, the material in the upper years gets more interesting. And so then you sort of, ex like I really excelled in, in fourth year, I graduated like top 10, even though in first year I was like always the bottom half of the class. Right. Is it um, Cause you weren't hanging out with Mike as much by then. Is that, that is true. Was? That was one of the major factors for sure. Um, but also because I, again, just maybe being a bit more mature that you, um, have a bit more common sense and sort of clinical practice. And I worked in a clinical practice as a vet student for like all the summers. And so I think the people who are the best vets are not necessarily the people who are the best, like book smart people. They're not the people who can rattle off the, the, the dosages and the, 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 how the renal system works and all the protein pumps and all that kind of stuff. Cause it really doesn't matter. The people who are the best vets are people who are practical. They have good communication skills with clients. They, they're just, yeah, they're just not solely academic people. And so I think that's where I sort of shine a little bit is where I'm, yeah, I'm not like the soup, the smartest person, but I am practical and have common sense, good with people. So I think that sort of helps my clinical practice a little bit more. Yeah. And I think yeah. that's great. I uh, like perspective for uh, like younger listeners. There's so many paths to the sort of ultimate goal of becoming a vet that you, you don't have to worry about it's that it's got to be a straight line. Like you're allowed to take detours. Yeah. And those detours 
in, in all the guests we've chatted with end up serving you so well and enriching like the experience and then the ultimate outcome. So it's, it's fantastic. Yeah. I, I do have to ask you, um, I was trying to keep track of it, but I lost track. So how many years of university did you do? Because I remember your, your like Facebook and Instagram posts always like first day of 13 years of school or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. I think it was like 14 and a half years of post-secondary. Wowzers. Yeah. I evaded paying taxes for so long. <laughs> so good. <laughs> And then when I graduated my first couple of years, I didn't even have to pay tax. I had like a bazillion tax credits for being a student for like over a decade. It was great. So no, now it's all catching up to you in 2020. You bet. I also like didn't pay into a pension plan for 14 years or, I mean, there were some downsides of taking a more meandering path, but for sure. Cool. Well, I mean, I think, I think it's led you to a really amazing place. So as we, as we kind of mentioned in your bio, currently you are working part-time as a clinical veterinarian and then also part-time in academia teaching first years. And I think this is, this is so cool how you've managed to, you know, you're kind of balancing two worlds. You're enjoying both of those worlds. You said it best with you always wanting a deeper understanding. And I've always sort of seen that in you, like you're always curious to learn more. So like, tell us about that. Tell us what it's like to be a clinical veterinarian half the time and a professor the other half the time. Uh, yeah, it's an interesting gig because you only get paid to be each of those things half the time, but you actually have to be those things all of the time, which is one of the sort of the cruxes of doing that. But yeah, so I worked in clinical practice for a year and a bit and the department head at the vet college emailed me and just said, we have an opening and we need like people are always going on sabbatical and stuff like that. We need somebody to teach first year anatomy and some other things would you be interested? And I thought that would be a, a good mix, right? I like teaching. My mom was a teacher. My dad did lots of university teaching. We sort of like that mentoring style. Um, so I thought that that would be a good fit. I also thought the university has lots of perks, right? Like they have benefits and they have a pension plan, like all that kind of stuff. But the lifestyle is a bit more flexible, flexible too, right? It's not a sort of a, a nine to five job, right? Like, so you can sort of flex your time a little bit better. And, um, and I thought interacting with the students and sort of having that clinical background where I could then teach the students like, Hey, we see this in clinical practice every day. This is actually important that, you know, and do you have to know all the blood vessels that go to the very distal digits? That's probably not important because you could always look that up and nobody uses that on a day-to-day -day practice. So I thought maybe my background, my maybe a bit younger sort of take on things would be good for students to have some, a bit of a clinical input because yeah, the faculty doesn't have a lot of, certainly in the first two years, doesn't have a lot of practicing clinicians that deliver the curriculum. Lots of people are vets, but have never, so they're licensed, but they, they've never practiced, right? They use their, their vet license for research animals and controlled drug logs and that kind of stuff. Um, and then lots of them are academics who do work in the vet college and use animal models and stuff like that, but don't have the veterinary training. So I thought, well, that would be a good hybrid. Um, I didn't want to completely lose my clinical practice, right? I thought I should still want to do lots of hands-on stuff. And I really like that area of, of things, but I thought, yeah, it's a good mix to sort of be a working person and then sort of mentor the next generation of the students coming through. Yeah. And yeah. I, I would assume the students love that, like bringing that clinical piece into the classroom you know, so that they can link it to the, to what they're ultimately going to be doing. I know like we have some mutual contacts and I got a text like a week or two ago about like Sarah's such a great like prof and you've won some teaching awards. So, I mean, that 
that combination seems to be working. Like the students seem to be enjoying it. Yeah, I think that it's like, I just remember going in vet school, just you would sit in the lectures and you would be given all of this material and you would have nothing to reference it to. You would have no idea why it was important. You would have no, um, like you had no idea that you had to know about the pancreas because it was related to diabetes, right? Like you just learned about the pancreas, where it was, what enzymes and stuff it makes. And then in two years from now, you'll learn about how to apply that. And then you have to go back into your like Rolodex and find that material that you had memorized, right? And so I do try to take an approach where the students can like have excitement and enthusiasm for what they're learning. And sort of, I think that it helps them sort of learn it better, understand it better, be invested in actually being there. Because it I think a lot of times you get just bogged down with the amount of material and you forget to be excited about like the end game of why you're there. And so, yeah, you, you talk about the stifle in a dog, super boring, right? Until you show them a video of a lame dog and then a cruciate surgery, and then they're super jazzed about it, right? And then they're going to go home and they're going to remember it and they're going to be excited about it. And so I think if you want students to actually learn and you want them to be invested in, in being at vet school, then you have to make it exciting for them. Otherwise it's just another thing to memorize. It gets lost in, in the stack of things that they're already supposed to just know, but they have no idea why they're supposed to know them. If I can jump in for a second, Sarah, this is a very interesting conversation because you're still pretty fresh out of school. You're a 2017 grad. Do you see a difference between when you started school in 2013, starting to learn anatomy as compared to in 2020, how that interaction has maybe changed and especially with social media and all the other influences that are now coming into education, is that affecting your teaching style or what you're seeing for your students? Yeah, not, I wouldn't say a lot, but I think it has sort of changed because I, again, haven't been teaching for that long. So I sort of started out in, in that place where it was already sort of a generational change. Exactly. And um, yeah, I think that the students really like it. And I think because they, they have such quick access to, to social media and to YouTube videos and all that kind of stuff that they want instead of reading a textbook, they would rather you deliver material that was sort of more engaging, more sort of new age or whatever. But um, yeah, and we, we've tried to make the curriculum in first year, I was a part of lots of like the curriculum review and stuff like that. And we've sort of tried to take as a department and as a vet school, not that we're watering the education down by any means, but trying to make it that it's more practical. Like what do the students have to know in order to be a good vet in four years from now? So what are, what are the goals that we want the students to know? What are the outcomes that we're going to ask them? How are we going to track these? So what are the indicators that like the students have done these things and, and try to measure it that way and to try to, maybe eliminate some of the stuff that um, that although it's still important fundamentally for the students to understand that they maybe don't have to understand it at such like an intense deep level so things like the embryology and the histology have sort of been pulled back a bit not to say that they're not important they are important but on a day-to-day basis your clinician is not looking at a brain section, right? If you are a small animal practitioner looking at a brain section, something has gone so wrong, right? Like on a number of levels, like one, your patient died, bummer. Two, you had like a cryostat sitting in the back with like paraffin that you fixed this tissue. You sat there, you sliced it, you made a whole bunch of slides, you had special stains, you looked at it under the microscope and then, and great, since you had done that course, you knew what was happening. Like, I just think that that doesn't happen. And so it's not a good use of curriculum time. 
I think that's where we sort of drew the line is we're like, if this is not something that people are going to do in the first year of their practice, then do we have to spend 80 hours teaching it to them? Could that time be better well spent? Right? So yeah, you're going to look at things like pee under a microscope. You're going to look at like different skin masses and maybe even a liver biopsy. Sure. Right. You could go that far, but like there's certain things that just seem to have in the first year curriculum certainly got really like in depth and the students lost interest in it. Right. Because it just didn't seem important. And it turns out that it, yeah, it's not. Yeah. And that's funny. I, I could picture myself staring in the microscope in histology <laughs> lab right now being like, man, I'm never doing this. This will never happen one time in my career. But Yeah, like, cool, that's a glial cell. C- cool, it's right by a neuron. Moving on. Yeah. I, yeah. I miss so many histology classes. <laughs> <laughs> I can't believe I'm admitting that on the podcast. But really, by week two, that is reality for, yes, the vast right? majority of us. We are never looking at this in practice. Yeah. And so I think that... Um, yeah, I think that we're just trying to get students to you I think the the biggest thing was the students were coming out with a fairly sort of minimal knowledge of thousands of different things. And I think the 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 revamp was we would like students to be good at hundreds of things, but better at those hundred things, right? So um, maybe have a deeper understanding of how, like, yeah, how the renal system works and how that works with chronic kidney disease in cats and stuff, because those are things that you're going to see in practice. And maybe we'll live, leave out like the weird liver tumors that happen to like 1% of cats, right? And they don't even happen in dogs or whatever. Like we'll leave that out. If you want to go do a residency or an internship, you can learn that there, right? Mm-hmm. So I think that um, I'm very much on board with that sort of teaching style. And I think, and maybe I was one of the ones being bossy, like sort of driving this is because yeah, like if I have to look it up in a textbook, then I shouldn't be the person standing at the front of the room lecturing you about it. That was sort of my, my take on things. Yeah, no, it's really practical. So like in your sort of career now, one, one kind of question I have is as you're sort of juggling these two hats, right? Like clinical hat, academic hat, do you find that that transition is it difficult to switch roles or does it recharge you right like is going and teaching an anatomy class actually like a very welcome break from dealing with clients and vice versa like how do those two do they have synergy do they conflict with each other like what's that like yeah and that's a good question i actually do think that they complement each other well back and forth because I do think that I like having a break from the clinic. The clinic is busy and there's notes to do and lots of paperwork and all that kind of stuff when you're not doing surgery or whatever and really hands-on and you're talking to the clients and, and doing some education and stuff that way lots of the time. But I do find that it's nice to go talk to students and have them ask questions and and sort of deal with that i do find like it's a nice break from having to yeah talk to clients or call clients back or do lots of paperwork i find that it's a good break but when i'm not at the clinic i do miss certain aspects of of that as well so yeah i think if you i wouldn't want to do sort of only one day a week at the clinic, I think maybe you'd get a bit behind and you'd lose touch with some of your clients and, and people already say to me, Oh, it's really hard to get in to see you because you're not here all the time. Right. And so I think if I was there less, that would maybe some of my clients would be even more Mm -hmm. upset that I wasn't there. But um, no, I do look forward to going to each individual job and I haven't showed up at the wrong job yet on the wrong yeah. <laughs> Could happen. 
So how would, how would um, someone, you know, if, if they're listening to this and they think, man, that would be a really nice fit for me, right? I want to work part-time as a clinician, but I'd like to do some, some other stuff as well, veterinary related. Any tips on how to sort of set yourself up to, to get in a position like you are? Um, yeah, you just got to talk to the right people, right? So if you're interested in teaching, there's, I mean, there's companies that put on CE and stuff all the time, right? So you could be one of their guest speakers or guest lecturers. If you were one of the experts in the field, if you wanted to sort of mentor other adults and other like vets and stuff, if you wanted to, I mean, you have to be a bit of an expert, right? I don't have to necessarily be an expert. I'm sort of like the jack of all trades kind of person. But um, yeah, with being, I think the this part-time faculty position sort of fit to some of the things that I'd done. I'd done lots of public speaking at conferences before. I'd done lots of, um, yeah, presentations. I, I like to, to learn and do all that kind of stuff. So yeah, I think if you are invested in doing something you can find or make yourself a job anywhere if you are able to sort of like sell your qualities and and say that's a good fit so like maybe you want to work part-time in clinical practice and you want to work part-time in government well if you're interested in doing that the cfi cfia will find you a job or or health canada will find you a part-time job right i think they're always looking for people who are motivated and interested and that kind of stuff so I think that yeah the standard you work at one place for 40 years is sort of a thing of the past I don't think that this generation like our generation and the next generations of vets I don't think that that's what their work day is going to look like I think that lots of people will have these these blended hybrid jobs because people are interested in lots of different things and the advice would be whatever you like to do, go find it and, and talk to somebody, find a mentor who is already doing that or find a company or whatever and, and go talk to them and have sort of an open conversation and say like, I want to be here. And you, I think people would be surprised at how inviting other workplaces are when you are volunteering to, to work there and to help, right? How sort of enthusiastic they would be about giving you a job. So I think people are just afraid to ask the, the questions to the right people. So that would be my advice is don't be afraid to ask questions to lots of different kinds of people. Cause you might be surprised at how often they would say, yes, sure. We'll hire you. Right. Yeah. Yeah. The answer is no, if you don't ask. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And I think a lot of people sell themselves short. So maybe you don't do it right off the bat, but maybe you're five years out and you've taken lots of CE or you've done some special training and then you do, you get a bit more qualified and then you can go do that kind of stuff. So, um, yeah, I think that the, the trick is that you have to be fluid and you have to sort of keep moving and keep learning. Cause if you, if you don't do any of that kind of stuff, it's going to be hard to, to, sell yourself to somebody and say, Hey, I'm really good at this. If you haven't actually gone and done anything yeah. extra. Yeah. yeah. And I do think like we, we kind of briefly chatted before on, you know, like burnout issues and, and how sustainable is full-time clinical veterinary practice over the course of 30 or 40 years. Cause it's, it's full on, like it gets exhausting. So these yeah. hybrid models, I mean, I could see it really helping people expand their career, you know, like the time that they can spend in this profession and really enjoy it. So like, I don't know if you're noticing that or what your thoughts on that are. Yeah. So I work 0.75 at the university and work 0.5 at the clinic. So I actually work 1.25. So I'm working more than full time, but when you like what you do, it sounds so cheesy, but when you like what you do, it doesn't always feel like work. Like I'm excited to go do those things. And so it doesn't feel, doesn't make me feel like, oh man, I have to go to work today. And so I think if you're, if you're, as long as you're enjoying it, then that means that you probably will have a better success rate and 
of, of having a career long term in this sort of field. Um, but yeah, I think having the variety is one of the things that keeps it keeps me happier, right? That I'm not, um, it seems again, less monotonous, right? Like I'm not doing the same thing every day. There's a lot of variety and I think that's good for me and for my soul and for my brain. Um, but yeah, it is, it's, I think the expectations of, of vets in sort of any walk of life, whatever you're doing is a lot and people just have to be conscious of that. But I think these hybrid type things where people are a practice owner and a clinician or that they work for CFIA, but they also work in mixed animal practice or like some combination of things will probably be a better lifestyle choice for, for, yeah, for most people. Cause yeah, working at the university, I'm not on call, right? People don't call me or, and if they email you at nine o'clock at night, well, they know that you're not going to check your email till tomorrow, right? It's not an emergency. And so as far as like the work life balance, some jobs are better suited than others being in clinical practice. You're ex- like people call you all the time, even on your, my days off. I'm sure you guys too on your day off. Oh, this cat that you saw last week is back and it has this and this and this. Um, do you want to see them or whatever? And you just think, no, it's my day off. Like I, and again, I think like if you were a, a doctor or a lawyer or whatever, and you were on holidays, I don't know if anybody would call you, but for whatever reason, the receptionist always calls you even on your day off because she, or they think you care, which you do care, but they also want you to work all the time. (laughs) So setting setting those boundaries of which we are not good as um, an industry and setting so far, I believe we are getting better, but we have a long ways to go. Yeah. I have terrible boundaries. Right. Like I've given clients my personal number. Why do I do that? I'm not I had a debate sure. with that with one of my mixed animal vets last week. And same thing. That individual gives out his cell phone to multiple people because that's the way it was done in the past. Yeah. Again, not right or wrong, but in the long term, what will that look like? Right. It means that they might text you on Christmas day or like on a Sunday morning or whatever. Right. So yeah, I think it's just, um, and it's particularly hard when you're only part time is cause yeah, people expect you to still sort of have the same full time availability for, and the clients expect that too, right? Like they want to be able to get their prescriptions and they want to be able to do all that kind of stuff. Um, but yeah, it is. It's just hard um, to to juggle both things. Yeah. With that being said, do you feel that your clinic and or what's being um, taught in the school is along the lines of we also need to be training the clients for expectations? We've spoken with that with a couple of podcast guests that it really is incumbent on us to do some of that training to expectations. Are you seeing that happen at all? Yeah. And I do talk to the students about that. And I talk to lots of my clients about that. Like when, if it's for, like we were chatting earlier about um, discounts and stuff like that. So when you're, when you give a client an estimate, I go through it with them and say, we do blood work for this reason. We, this, your pet is going to be on IV fluids because we don't want them to go hypotensive and we want to, emergency access right we're not just trying to steal money from you but we're we're doing this for a medical reason and i think for that when you do that kind of stuff i've had lots of clients or i would say less clients now not debate the price they see value in what you're doing and so if you can sit down and explain it to them then they're not as likely to sort of want to get a discount or nickel and dime because they see that you are giving the best care to their pet. But yeah, I've had lots of clients. um, They want a discount. They think it's too much and all that kind of stuff. And yeah, you have to talk to them about expectations and, and that this is a a service, right. And that I have 
uh, like this is my job, right? If you, if I give you a discount, then I have to take a discount for paying my rent and paying my, or my mortgage and my cell phone bill. And then my kids don't get all that kind of stuff. So like, and I've talked to a few clients, um, about like discounts and stuff. And they said, you wouldn't get a discount at a grocery store, at a gas bar, at like anywhere else if, right. And so I don't, I find, I don't tell them that I find it offensive, but I do find it offensive that people would ask you like a highly trained person, right. Who's been in school a long time. I think it's partially because the, the healthcare system in Canada, people don't understand how much healthcare costs. Like people nickel and dime you $400 a year cat spade. If you wanted to go get spade, it would cost the, cat, like the Canadian healthcare system like $25,000, right? So, yep. and yes, you have to go home with pain medications. It's not an option. That cannot be what we take off the bill. You right. are going to have a catheter placed without that's, that's not a question. Right. And yeah. And people are just like, Oh, my cat's not painful. It doesn't need medication. And I was like, we just took out its uterus. Like, come on, you have to internalize that that would be painful. So the $17 of Medicam that we're sending home, I will insist that it gets sent home. Okay. And yes, the cat space still $400. Sorry about that. Right. So uh, but yeah. we're saying, sorry about it, right? We, we feel bad about that, which is so difficult. Yeah. That comment in itself is really hard because we do. We feel bad that we're charging that much. And yet our professional time in your 20 years worth of school is worth it. Right. Yeah. No. And I know it's crazy um, it to, to think about it, but you also think that in an industry that's uh, an optional service, right? That people are, and especially during things like recessions and COVID and stuff like that, money is tight for people and you want to be able, like my, I always think my primary objective is to make sure that the pet has what they need. And if it, if it means $200 less for the clinic, and that pet gets what it needs and that that's the make or break point for the owner. Usually we can work something out, but yeah, it does set an unrealistic client expectation that they got a discount this time that maybe next time they'll always just expect a discount. So it's a slippery slope for sure. To, and it's hard. It's, and and it's, it's hard. hard to do with grads. Again, we don't receive, I, I can only speak to my WCVM experience at that point is we did not receive the communication training on how to deal with those conversations. Yeah. And the curriculum is different now. They do get lots of, of communication classes and I think it's better, but yeah, we certainly, we do, we have to have expectations for our clients and we have to be okay with saying, like you said, like our education is worth something we should feel like, and that's the only thing that you have to sell, right? Is you have to sell your time and your knowledge, right? And if you aren't charging for that, then yeah. What that's else are we gonna have left? Yep. Yeah. So I don't know. And maybe, I mean, you guys could have a whole podcast on pet insurance and stuff like that. But now that pet insurance is more prominent, I mean, we don't have a ton of clients with pet insurance, but the people who do have pet insurance, they just say yes, like, right? Like we have pet insurance. They're not sort of sort of shocked at the price or anything like that. And they just say, if that's what needs to be done, go ahead. So I wonder if more and more pet insurance happens, if, if we'll have these conversations sort of less and less and, and that the vet industry itself will be sort of less conflicted about pricing and charging and all that kind of stuff. Um, because the clients are going to be less worried about it coming out of their pocket in, in like a large sum of money. Yeah. It's a great point. And this is to Mike and I afterwards, because it'd be great to have a guest on to your exact point from the UK where, where pet insurance is more prevalent in that mm-hmm. 25 plus percentages compared to our two to 3% here in North America. Um, love your, love that point. Yeah. And you look yeah. at what it did for the dental industry, like when Absolutely. insurance became mainstream for dental. Changed it. Yeah. Yeah. And I can't wait for the day that I make the same amount of money as a dentist. Yeah. That'll be great. Yeah. 
that could take a little bit, but yeah. Yeah. Okay. We don't normally, uh, deep dive specific veterinary tasks, but you and I were chatting about one in particular, um, and that's euthanasia. And we kind of saw a gap in, uh, maybe some of the, the training or lack thereof in the training we receive on a task that we do as clinical veterinarians all the time. And when we were doing kind of our pre-recording chat, this is a procedure that in a lot of ways is make or break. Like I know in my time in practice, a really good euthanasia experience for a client typically bonds them to you for life, right? Like they'll be back with their new puppy, their new kitten. And a really bad euthanasia experience is very traumatic. Um, so we were chatting, Sarah, I know you have a lot of tips on kind of mastering that skill, things you do, and a really cool thing you do to kind of bookend it. Um, so can you share some of that with us and the listeners on sort of mastering the soft skills of euthanasia? Yeah. And yeah, exactly like you said, I didn't do a single euthanasia in the vet curriculum. I worked in a private practice that I didn't get to see some of it, but I think it, and hopefully it's better now, but yeah, certainly students need to be exposed to that. And hopefully with more communication classes and stuff like that, it's getting better. But I just, when I came out of practice, um, into practice, I remember it was the first like three weeks of practice and this dog came in and the the owners were just like, I don't know what's going on. They were totally fine yesterday and today they can't walk. So, okay, we run blood work or whatever and the dog's blood work comes out and it's in like bazillion stage renal failure, right? Like the levels don't even read. It's like too high to read on the thing. And I, and I thought, okay, I got this. And I go back into the room and the lady goes, okay, so we can fix it. Right. And I, I honestly, I'm not a crier. I broke down crying and I just looked at her and I said, you know what? I can't fix this. And I'm really, I'm really sorry to have to tell you that, that this is something that I don't think that we can fix. Your dog's 15 and it has like really end stage kidney disease. And I think that she probably didn't necessarily appreciate me crying, but I, as a professional, but thought that it was like, that I was obviously compassionate about the sort of the situation that she was in. And yeah. And so I just, that was the first youth that I had to do on my own. And I thought, well, this is terrible for me. Like how terrible must this be for her? Right. So um, I sort of just walked her through what happens, right? So that there's no surprises and just said, like, you can take as much time as you want. You, you, it doesn't have to be right now. I mean, you could probably send them home with a day or two of sub Q fluids. If you guys need more time, like I understand that this is sort of sudden news. And I think they, they took an hour or so in my exam room and just sort of said goodbye. And her husband came and, um, and, and then we did everything. But yeah, I think that first one really hit me thinking like, we're, yeah, we're not super prepared. It's a very emotionally charged scenario that you're in. Um, yeah. And it's a really hard choice for these people to make, right? This is, they've often had these pets for a really long time since they were puppies or kittens or whatever. And that this is, and lots of people more and more now, especially in companion animal medicine, right? These are not pets. These are family members, right? And so this is like a really intense situation. And so I thought this is a time that I really need to, to be on your A game and make sure that this is a good experience for these people because they are emotionally invested in this, in this pet. So yeah, usually what I, from then on, I, I always just said to myself, never going to rush these, right? So I'm going to book long appointments. I never want to run late and make people wait. Um, I mean, occasionally I've had to right? a dog gets hit by a bus and comes in at the same time as like a booked euthanasia. And so you're trying to juggle both things and, and clients understand they get it. But yeah, generally I try to not 
make it feel rushed. Like I'm trying to do my job and get out. It's not like a conveyor belt sort of experience. And then, yeah, I try to um, make it so that the, the clients are, are thinking about the good, the good memories, right? Like obviously lots of times their pets are there on, on their worst day and trying to, and I find that it's good to try to distract the owners to think about what was their favorite activity? What was their favorite food? Tell me about the things that they did when they were a puppy. Where did you get them? Try to get to know the clients too. Sometimes you haven't had a chance to, uh, to build a relationship with these clients they are coming in for the first time and to sort of make them feel like you care, which you, you do, you should. Um, to make them feel like you're invested in, in being there and it's not just part of your job that you're emotionally invested in that. So yeah, I try to have a bit of a conversation. I also think it's good. It distracts them from feeling so sad and lots of them, as soon as you start talking about those things, you can see that their whole demeanor, they change, they sort of perk up. They're happier about thinking about, oh yeah, they used to do all these things and they used to chase squirrels and sticks and all that kind of stuff. Um, yeah. And then I, and then I walk them through what's going to happen. Like if they have never euthanized a pet before, then there's some things that can happen that can be pretty shocking, right? Like they can, the animals can take gasping breaths and you just assure them that their pet is not painful, that this is sort of a muscle reaction that happens to the medications, um, that they lose bladder and bowel function, right? Lots of people want to hold their pets after, which is completely fine. I just, we have blankets and all that kind of stuff. I just let them know that that's a thing that could happen, right? So that they're not surprised. Um, And then I, I mean, I've had most of them go well. Sometimes they don't, right? We've, the animals who come in, they're old and dehydrated and their veins are crappy, right? And you can't get a catheter in. I've had lots of people like so angry with us. Like, why can't you do your job? Why can't you get this catheter in all this kind of stuff? And you just have to, in that moment, know that they're so that that's part of their grieving process, that they're not probably like mad at you personally. Um, And just stay calm. I, I always just say like, we're, we're really trying our best. And um, sometimes these things are difficult and just sort of just remain calm. And then, yeah, would I, I think that, after sort of euthanizing a lot of animals, it can start to wear on you and be emotionally sort of sad. So early on, like from day one, from that very first euthanasia, I thought I should write everybody a card, like a handwritten card. It takes two minutes after the, after the euthanasia. If I got to run to the next thing, I do it at the end of the day. And I, yeah, I write like, I'm really sorry for your loss. And it was really nice to, to get to know you it sounded like fluffy had like the best life and they were really lucky to have you and just sort of sort of helps me decompress but also i'm sure they enjoy a bit of a sort of a more personal sentiment to Mm -hmm. do that and so yeah it just sort of wraps everything up i think for me emotionally that i have sort of taken that whole experience full circle and and dealt with it instead of just like sort of shoving the sadness and the emotions down and, and just adding on it every day until you explode. Yeah. And I, <laughs> and I want to add to that because you and I were chatting about this, like in more depth, this is a personalized card from Sarah directly one-on-one, not the card that the clinic produces. Cause I know a lot of clinics, yeah will produce uh, euthanasia cards and the, and the whole team, the whole staff will sign them. But you've taken that sort of a step further where this card comes only from you and it's personalized. And I, that part is really what caught me because, I mean, for the client, it's so valuable. For you, um, it's so valuable to kind of like bookend that experience and deal with it emotionally. Um, so that was, that was really cool when you kind of shared, shared with me that that's your process. Yeah. Well, I thought, I mean, after the whole vet experience is a stressful like experience and you have ups and downs and yeah, it's, uh, you can have emotional burnout and just 
all that kind of stuff. And I thought early on, I need to make sure that that doesn't happen. And one of the reasons is doing things that are sad, right? So I don't think that it ever gets easier. I think you know how to anticipate a little bit better, but I mean, it's always still a sort of an emotionally draining task to, to perform one of those things. Um, and so, yeah, I thought I need to have something and I don't, that's maybe not what it's going to be for everybody, but people, I think it's important for sort of vets and students and stuff to think about that early on to say like, this is going to be an emotionally taxing endeavor and part of my job. And I need to figure out how to deal with that so that it doesn't like derail me. Um, and so, yeah, whether or not it's going outside and just like walk around the block after or meditate or yeah, write them a card or make a donation or whatever it is that you're going to do, find a thing that helps you sort of make peace with these events because yeah, I think that you can get really, really sad by basically putting a whole bunch of pets down and not really reflecting with that and dealing with it at the time. Yeah, no, I agree. And good for you for like foreseeing that, like putting th this step in place before it was a problem. Right. So yeah. that's amazing. Okay, Sarah. Well, time's flying. We okay. got yeah. we got to pivot over and uh, jump into our impact round. So a series of questions for you. Um, are you a cat or a dog person? Dog person for sure. Yes. You've got yeah. Kona. Kona's yeah, we got the... Kona. Yeah. Yeah. We never grew up with cats. We always grew up with non shedding dogs with dog tails. You still have a long life left in order to be able to have all the cats you'd like. I know. That's true. <laughs> You're a cat person, then I assume. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. This is a cat podcast. So, yes. So, we're, we're gonna not going to yeah. publish this anymore. Okay. Well, that's fine. <laughs> No hard feelings. Love it. Love it. Uh, true or false? I knew I wanted to be a veterinarian since I was a kid. Uh, true, and then a deviation, and then also true. Yeah. True, false, true. True, false, true. Yeah. True, false, true. Okay. How would your friends describe what you do for a living? Everybody just calls me a puppy doctor. Puppy doctor. What's your license yeah. plate? You have dog doc. Dog doc, right? Yeah. right. Okay, next question. Off script, you're the only guest that's going to get this question. Okay. I have an ongoing bet with your husband. Yes. <laughs> regarding a case, well, multiple cases of beer. That's so true, yeah. For the listeners, uh, the bet that I have with Daniel is every year, and we use May Long as kind of the, the line in the sand, every May Long that passes that Sarah does not go back to school and add more letters or credentials to her name, I owe Daniel a case of beer. But if at any point ever in the future, Sarah goes back to school, Daniel has to repay me the case of beer and double it. So my impact... Retroactively. Yeah, retroactively forever. So my impact question to Sarah is, are you going to go back to school, add on to your... 14 and a half years of education and get more credentials? Um, I want to, but Daniel doesn't think that we can afford the beer. Well, yeah, interest <laughs> is accruing for sure. Yeah. I mean, I'm obviously rooting hard for you to go back to school because my beer yeah. fridge will be stocked. Yeah. I honestly, I don't know if when it would happen, if it would happen, but I would love to go do a surgical residency. That would be, that would be the dream. But Sounds that might not happen for like 10 years. So then you will get 20 cases of beer on your front doorstep. It's going to be a good day. That'll be yeah, a great be All right with that, Sarah. Yeah, oh, I think man. that would be okay. Okay. Now we have it. It's recorded. Yeah. yeah. It's going to, yeah, it's that's not, awesome. It's not off the table. Good. That's what I wanted to hear. I knew I had to put you on the spot to get a good answer out of you. So there we go. Okay. Back on track. What is your favorite hobby? Uh, I like to bake. 
you guys do. You guys, you, you and Daniel both are phenomenal bakers. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe when I retire, I'll open like a bake shop. Or I thought about having like a, uh, my own clinic and, and like a bake shop next door. Yeah. So in my clinic that I'm building, I want to have literally, I I'm already working into the design to have a little oven so that we can have fresh cookies and such pastry stuff smell. I had a clinic I worked with as a key account manager in the States that did that with a full on kitchen. It was amazing. And it was yeah, such a great environment to walk into even yeah, as a or, clinic. Yeah. Or like a, a vet clinic with a cat cafe next door. Totally. That would be good. You could call it like cats and cupcakes or something. I don't know. That's awesome. Lots pets of possibilities. And, pets and pastries. We'll have a pets and pastries business. That's a good name right there. Someone's going to steal yeah. it now. Now, now it's going to be taken. Yeah, that's okay. <laughs> what in this world are you most grateful for? I am, I'm grateful for many things. But I would be grateful for my upbringing. Like my parents were so solid growing up. I mean, they had high expectations of us, but just such good mentors of how to like juggle the work-life balance. My parents are both really sort of successful um, academically, professionally, and but also sort of socially right so i think that they taught us that you can do both like i had a working mom growing up she like showed no mercy right she took four months of mat leave and then back at it right and so but never missed a dance recital or music lesson or anything like that and just really gave us lots of opportunities that way and so i think i'm i'm really thankful for having them show us that you don't have to choose that you can be both things and and that you don't have to sort of make apologies or concessions for being a working parent that your kids will I still love them so that they'll love you anyway right for yeah. doing all those things so yeah I think a super super grateful for all the opportunities and stuff because like I said when I was little there were no no boundaries. You talk to people and said, Oh, well, I became this because I wasn't allowed to be that. And I just thought that never, that was not in our world where you were not allowed to be something. You could be whatever you wanted. Yeah. So that's, that's amazing. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much, Sarah, for joining us. I mean, it's been awesome uh, chatting with you. Anything to, to add in, Jonathan? No, I just really appreciate your time today getting to know you. Uh, both on and off the air here. Mike spoke about you for months and wanted to have you as a guest. So great to have you finally join us. Well, yeah, thanks so much for having me. This is great. And it was good to get to know you a little bit better, Jonathan. And um, yeah, it was a fun time. It wasn't as stressful as I thought it would be. No, never is. Never okay. Is. So for, for any of the, the listeners, um, if they want to reach out to you, get a hold of you, um, how can they do that? Um, probably best to email me. So uh, Sarah, S-A-R-A-H dot Bader, B-A-T-E-R at usask.ca. Awesome. And we'll, uh, yeah. we'll get that put into the, the show notes as well. Um, so as always, as we wrap up, the last word goes to you, Sarah. What message do you want to leave for the veterinary community? Hmm. Yeah, I would think like what I always say to my students is as they feel like overwhelmed with the amount of, of information and stuff that you have to know in this industry, right? You have to, there are specialists, but general practitioners end up seeing a huge range of stuff. And I think it can be overwhelming. Um, just don't, yeah, don't forget to be confident in what you know and, and, um, and yeah, embrace that, that you are smarter than you probably think, and then enjoy it, right? I think if you're not happy in what you're doing, then you should do something else, right? And if that doesn't have, mean that you have to quit being a vet or quit veterinary practice in, in its entirety, but you can always 
if you feel like that burnout and you're not happy that I think people are just really afraid to switch gears and, and do something that makes them happy because of whatever reason they're afraid of change or whatever. But I don't think that that's a good reason to just keep doing the same thing if it doesn't um, spark joy. Right. So um, yeah, don't be afraid to, to make the, the veterinary career what you want. Cause I think that there's so many opportunities that people miss out on. Um, so I'm not done. I don't think morphing my career and my life. I have a, a list of things that I have yet to accomplish. So I look forward to wherever that may take me. Thank you for listening to the Veterinary Project Podcast. As a recap, on behalf of our hosts, the Veterinary Project Podcast will be releasing new episodes weekly. So be sure to tune in as we bring you more conversations aimed at helping you enjoy a life well lived. If you enjoyed what you heard on the show and you want to stay in the know, please like, love, and or subscribe to the podcast on the listening platform of your choosing, as we're available on all the usual suspects. If you know of others that may benefit from these conversations, we'd love it if you please share the show with them, as this will help us grow our community to reach more and more veterinary professionals. Speaking of which, if you are a veterinary professional and would like to get connected with more like-minded individuals who are joining us on this journey, please send an email to the Veterinary Project Podcast at gmail.com, and we'll invite you to be a part of our private Facebook group general feedback, requests for information, or perhaps requests to be a guest on the show can also be sent to the Veterinary Project Podcast at gmail.com. Dr. Michael Bug and Dr. Jonathan Light, thank you for listening to the show, and we'll catch you again next week for another episode of the Veterinary Project Podcast. Bye for now. Bye for now.